something actually set precedents that are contrary to the constitutional provisions that we already have existing in this country. Bishop William Barber, I want to thank you for being with us, national co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, president and senior lecturer at Repairers of the Breach, founding director of the Center for Public Theology and Public Policy at Yale Divinity School, co-author of the new book, White Poverty, How Exposing Myths About Race and Class Can Reconstruct American Democracy. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, War, Peace, and the Presidency, Breaking with Convention. We're broadcasting from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, throughout this week uh, as we come to the conclusion of the Republican National Convention. On Thursday, Donald Trump spoke for over 90 minutes in the longest convention speech in history. One word he never mentioned was abortion or the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. v. Wade, thanks to three conservative judges he appointed. Republican vice president candidate J.D. Vance also did not mention the word abortion once. In fact, according to The Washington Post, the word abortion wasn't mentioned a single time from the stage during at least the first three days of the convention. However, this week, CNN did unearth a 2022 comment by Vance where he said he supports a national abortion ban. Do you think it will it will be resolved nationally? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly would like abortion to be legal nationally. To talk more about what was not talked about at the RNC, we're joined by Amy Littlefield, abortion access correspondent at The Nation. Amy, welcome back to Democracy Now! Um, so we're talking a lot about what the president and other um, Republican speakers spoke of this week, uh, the main theme, vilification of immigrants. Um, they didn't talk about abortion, uh, but certainly that is a major theme of uh what President Trump wants to do in this next term. Can you talk about what was and hasn't been talked about? I mean, not one single word about abortion from Donald Trump last night and all 92 plus minutes of that speech. Not one single word from J.D. Vance, who we know is a diehard abortion opponent. I mean, this is stunning, Amy, even though I knew to expect it. To see Donald Trump talk more about crime rates in Venezuela and El Salvador than he did about what is arguably the crowning conservative achievement of his entire presidency, which is handing conservatives this 50-year long dream, you know, the culmination of this 50-year long dream they've had of overturning Roe v. Wade. I mean, this is arguably his most unequivocal victory, and he doesn't mention it once. Um, again, I knew to expect it, because I know that Republicans can read the polls. They know that abortion has triumphed in all seven instances where it's been on the ballot since the Dobbs decision. They know that a rising number of people support abortion rights. Um, they know that 79 percent of people oppose the idea of a nationwide abortion ban. And so it's no surprise. And yet it really felt like the end of an era to me. I mean, I felt like I was watching the end of 40 plus years where Republicans have opportunistically used the issue of abortion to win elections. And now they're suddenly taking abortion by the shoulder and shuffling her off the stage and saying, you know, well done, you served your purpose, you helped us, you know, consolidate power over the last, you know, 40 odd years, and uh, we're not going to talk about you anymore. Um, there's several really important caveats here that I want to highlight. I mean, one is that the fact that Republicans aren't talking about abortion does not in any way mean that they're not going to continue to act on it, right? I mean, if you read the Republican Party platform, it's clear they're induced, endorsing the idea that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution protects fetal personhood, protects the due process and, and equal rights of embryos. If you read Project 2025, it's clear they believe that the Comstock Act from 1873, right, another instance of the Victorian era law coming back to life potentially from the history books, um, is a de facto nationwide ban on the mailing of abortion pills. Um, and so they're using these ways that don't actually require any public buy-in, potentially. I think we can see their plan is to go for a nationwide ban on abortion that doesn't require the approval of Congress, that doesn't require the democratic process, because they're going to go back into the history books 
and, you know, revive this law potentially from an era um, when, you know, it was used to go after obscene books and pornographic drawings. Um, so the other really important caveat, Amy, as you've covered on this show, I mean, it seems clear that the new found target um, that's that's been tapped to replace abortion um, is transgender people, and in particular transgender children, some of the most vulnerable people in this country. Um, the the punchline about women's sports, about like, well, at least our side knows, you know, the difference between men and women. I mean, that was this a drumbeat as much as drill, baby, drill, as much as the anti-immigrant rhetoric at this convention. Um, 625 anti-trans bills introduced this year, a record. I mean, I used to sit here and say that same, you know, similar numbers when we were talking about anti-abortion legislation years ago. So we're really talking about that same anti-abortion playbook now being trained on transgender people because Republicans think that's going to be more popular. Well, Amy Littlefield, I mean, it may be because of the silence from the stage on the question of abortion that many uh, media reports uh, seem to conclude that the Republican Party is now softening its stance on abortion. Do you believe that's true? Far from it, Nermeen. I'm so glad you asked that question. I mean, it was widely reported when the Republican Party platform came out that they were softening their stance on abortion. And that's because it mentions, you know, states getting to have a say in abortion. First of all, I want to push back on this idea that allowing states to decide on abortion is in any way a moderate stance, right? We have now total bans in at least 14 states in this country. Um, We're witnessing nightmare scenarios where hemorrhaging women are being airlifted to neighboring states by helicopter, where people in the process of miscarrying are coming close to death. Um, where people in states like Texas experiencing pregnancy complications are dying, where people are being consigned to pregnancy against their will. Okay, that's under the scenario now, which is states deciding, right, which is a deeply unequal system. Um, But secondly, they're not giving up on the idea of a nationwide ban. And that's very clear when you read the text of the Republican platform itself, which endorses the idea that the 14th Amendment protects the constitutional rights of embryos and fetuses. And if that is the case, that the 14th Amendment already protects embryos and fetuses, then we don't need a new constitutional amendment or a bill passed by Congress to ban abortion nationwide, because they can make the argument that that fetuses are already people. Look, it's right here in the Constitution. Um, And that argument, of course, would have ramifications for in vitro fertilization. It would have ramifications for contraception. And so far from being a softening of the stance, I think we have to be really concerned about this effort to, again, go back to existing texts, you know, understanding that abortion is more popular than any candidate in this election. And she'd win today if you put her on the on the top of the ticket. Um, You know, they're they're looking for ways to do this through anti-democratic backdoor channels. And um, and the platform has it right there in plain text. And I think much of the media really missed the mark when they accepted the idea that this was a softening. So, Amy, as we begin to wrap up right now, um, if you can talk about the map right here, you know, something about the Republican and Democratic conventions, you know, every state has a post and it says it's state. But the map of abortion access in this country right now and the significance of who is president Who gets to appoint judges, not just Supreme Court justices, but federal judges on down and why that matters so much when it comes to the issue of reproductive rights and abortion? It matters so much, Amy. And we've seen what Trump's three appointees to the Supreme Court have done, wreaking havoc not just on abortion rights, but on a host of other issues underpinning our democracy I mean, the map of abortion access right now, you know, I was recently in Florida, which is one of at least six states that's going to have a ballot initiative on abortion this election. These ballot initiatives are what I'm going to be watching very closely. Florida has a six week ban in place now. Florida used to be the destination state. It was like a funnel into which, you know, patients from all across the South would travel. Eighty four thousand abortions, I believe, last year. And now they can only do abortions up until six weeks. And so I sat in the waiting room of a clinic in Florida and watched people being sorted into groups based on the difference of a few millimeters of growth on an embryo the size of a pea, right? Whether they were six weeks one day and they were too late or whether they were five weeks, three days and uh, or five weeks, four days and they could get an abortion still in the state of Florida. 
Um, so people in Florida are going to be voting directly on this issue. That's also the case in Nevada and a number of other states. It could be the case in several other states, including um, the swing state of Arizona. Um, so I think abortion is going to have a huge impact um, on this election. But I also want to say, you know, it's kind of incredible that we have, you know, the two top of the ticket candidates, at least right now as we're speaking in this moment, are Donald Trump, who, you know, declared himself very pro-choice many years back in 1999, right? And um, Joe Biden, Joe not so big on abortion Biden or not big on abortion Biden, um, uh, who, you know, in the 70s and 80s went so far as to vote against rape exceptions and incest exceptions in the federal funding ban, um, the Hyde Amendment, the ban on Medicaid, federal funding of abortion. Um, and where, you know, these are kind of the two people to choose between in an election where abortion is going to be one of the primary issues. I think the Democratic Party really needs to articulate a, a strong pro-abortion stance that doesn't just involve, um, you know, abortion up until viability and for rape and incest victims, right? And I think to the point of what your previous guest was saying, we need a reproductive justice new deal. We need a platform for 2024 that is about economic justice as well as abortion and that ties those two issues together if the Democrats are going to win. Amy Littlefield, I want to thank you for being with us, abortion access correspondent at The Nation magazine. Next up, we look at the recent killings of two black men here in Milwaukee. Samuel Sharp was a homeless veteran, and Devante Mitchell was killed by security guards outside the Hyatt, where delegates are swarming through right now, where journalists are getting their press credentials. More in a minute. When you attend a funeral, it is sad to think that sooner or later those you love will do the same for you. And you may have thought it tragic, not to mention other adjectives, to think of all the weeping they will do, but don't you worry. No more ashes, no more sackcloth, and an armband made of black cloth will someday never more adorn a sleeve. For if the bomb that drops on you gets your friends and neighbors too, there'll be nobody left behind to grieve, and we will all go together when we go. What a comforting fact that is to know. Universal bereavement, an inspiring achievement. Yes, we all will go together when we go. We will all go together when we go All suffused with an incandescent glow No one will have the endurance To collect on his insurance Lloyds of London will be loaded when they we go We will all go together when we go By Tom Lehrer This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org War, Peace, and the Presidency Breaking with Convention We're broadcasting from Milwaukee Just after the last night of the Republican National Convention I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh Here in Milwaukee, protesters marched on Thursday Through downtown to call for justice For Samuel Sharp and Devontae Mitchell Samuel Sharp was a 43-year-old unhoused black man who was shot dead in Milwaukee by police officers from Ohio who were here in Wisconsin as part of a group of 4,500 law enforcement officials here for the RNC. The shooting took place a mile from the RNC's proceedings. Sharp's death came weeks after security guards at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Milwaukee killed Devontae Mitchell. The 43-year-old black father died after security guards pinned him to the ground. Democracy Now! was at the protest and march on Thursday. This is Katrina Games, the aunt of Sam Sharp. But first we hear from Naisha Mitchell, the big sister of Devante Mitchell. My name is Naisha Mitchell. Devante was my brother. I was his big sister. We are definitely going to keep fighting for justice here. 
We appreciate all you guys' support. We just ask for the community to keep on coming out here with us, keep standing with us until we get some answers. You know, no one has been charged. No one has been arrested. They're saying that they're waiting on autopsy results, but we saw the video. We all saw the video. Why do we need autopsy results to determine if these people need to be arrested or convicted of a crime? We saw them murder him in broad daylight. We need answers, and we want it now, and we need justice now. My name is Katrina Gaines. I'm here on behalf of my nephew for his mother's sake. Now, most people that know Sam Sharp, they know that he has MS and he doesn't, his gait is unbalanced. He wanted to be on his own with his MS. He didn't want us to feel like we had to take care of him or burden him. He told us all that God told him to go and help in that community. And that's what he did. But for the police to just shoot him like that, 27 bullets, come on, and you shot my nephew like that. You shot him. It didn't take all of that. If he was someone else, if he was a different race, and I hate to bring race in this because I have all races in my family, but you wouldn't have killed him like that. You wouldn't have shot him like that. 27 bullets, and all this he was doing was trying to protect Himself. He went to the police and they did nothing. And now my nephew is shot. He is shot and he is dead and it is just horrible. For more, we're joined by two guests here in Milwaukee. Angelique Sharp is the sister of Sam Sharp Jr., shot 27 times by Columbus, Ohio, police officers near the Republican National Convention, about a mile away on Tuesday. And we're joined by Wisconsin State Representative Darren Madison, whose district includes Milwaukee. He's a member of Democratic Socialists of America. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Angelique, I met you yesterday um, at the rally that ended at the Hyatt. Um, you were in Red Hour Park. And first, my condolences on the death of Thank your you. brother. You are very brave to come here today Thanks. because you just lost him. Um, can you tell us what happened to, Sh to Sam? I mean, the fact that officers from Columbus, Ohio, who are coming to the RNC to be part of the thousands of police officers here for this national security event— um, open fire on your brother, explain. Thank you um, for your condolences. Uh, first, first and foremost, um, the situation from our perspective is that Sam, he had actually complained about a bully that lived in the the shelterless community down there. He actually called on Saturday. Uh, the police have not contacted our family, asked for any, not a question. I phone logs. Just that. to be clear, you're saying that your brother Sam called the police for help? At least that's what we were under the understanding that he called the police for help. But he called home and he came home that day as well. He called home Saturday and I called him and he had told my mother that he was feared for his life. Someone told him that they were going to kill him, his dog and burn his tent down. He was afraid. And I, my mother was hysterical. She said, and she called me. She said, Angelique, call Sam. I called Sam. He answered the phone. He repeated this to me. And he said, Angelique, um, you know, I was like, well, what you want me to do? And he was like, well, I, re I really don't want you involved, you know, down here because you don't know anything about this community. Um, You're talking about the kind of the unhoused encampment absolutely. where he had moved out of the house to live. Absolutely. Like, I would go visit him and, you know, give him money or ask him, was he OK, or batteries or whatever that he might need. Um, but I, w I didn't, like, hang out down there or anything like that. And so he didn't want me to just be immersed in the community like that. So he was like... Um, he basically uh, said that, um, you know, if this person tries to come for him, he's going to have to protect himself and not to go down there. Then that was Saturday. Tuesday, the day that this happened, he came home at about 5, 36 o'clock in the morning. He said that whoever this was chased him 
out of the encampment um, to, to the house. So he left his dog, Isis, down there. And he complained again to my mother that this person was trying to make good on what they were, what they were trying to, what they said they was going to try to, you know, to premeditate a murder. And so ultimately, um, they got into a standoff. And what we're seeing in the video, uh, the body cam, is a video without context. So, and it, the con meaning you're seeing Sam with what in his hands? So he has, he does have like, uh, we believe that they were pairing knives and he was like open, like most, a lot of the uh, shelterless community uh, may not have regular appliances and tools that you have in the kitchen. They will open cans and eat out of whatever. And so maybe he had already had this, you know, around. And or, you're saying it was to protect himself? He also had MS? He had MS, which would have affected his balance, um, his hearing. And this person knew that, that Sam wasn't, everybody down there knew Sam was not physically stealth to stand. Even the local police knew him. They knew. But they were local police. They were local and police. And these were police from Ohio who'd come in to supposedly provide security for the convention. They, have, they don't have any clue about that community at all. Right. So they opened fire. They opened fire, and they were far from him. They were far from him, and so t a couple of things that come into play that really um, is, bef you know, have us baffled. One, Sam has MS that affects your hearing. Two, nobody's talking about this happened on seventh, fifteenth, uh, about fifteenth and. Um, the lead on 16th Street is one of the the most busy thoroughfare streets in the city. The traffic, this is high noon. We're talking about noontime, lunchtime traffic in the middle of a work day. Loud vehicles. So on top of him not being able to hear and traffic, how are you supposed to hear hear police from that far away telling you to give any commands and not only that in the video it backs it up because neither one of the men responded to the to the they could hear otherwise there's no way that both of them didn't turn around and and respond they're both and um i also the i want to um debunk the narrative that that this person life was in danger i've never seen a person come to a, a fight a, a quote-unquote knife fight that's in danger, that's engaging with, quote unquote, the perpetrator. Why aren't you running? Why aren't you, if you are imminent danger and you're scared for your life, there's no way that 25 or 30 police officers, however many it is, put that many brains together and that's and, and talked about he had a knife and that's the only conclusion you came up with was to go down there and shoot him and kill him dead like that. Well, Representative Darren uh, Madison, uh, if you could respond to this uh, tragic incident and the fact that black people in Wisconsin are nearly six times more likely to be killed by police than white people, if you could just say what specific measures you're advocating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, one, I want to uplift that, you know, that that community over over there, there's um, repairs of the breach in that neighborhood, which is uh 24-hour day shelter um, that provides services for folks who are unhoused um, in that community, um, which that encamp that's why that encampment is there, and that's why local law enforcement know a lot of the folks that in that community and know how to navigate those relationships. As it relates to the broader context of our, uh, of our local communities, um, you know, we, black and black folks in this city, um, have navigated police violence um, since the uh, you know ten, since the 1950s. Um, that was one of the first killings of uh, of a black male um, by the by the hands of law enforcement um, reported in our state, um, and that has only happened more and more times throughout history. In recent years, that's happened a series of times, which has led to communities crying for um, for real change as it relates to. Um, law enforcement procedures and practices to ensure that folks can be safe in their own community. Some of the bills that, you know, I've been working on over the past year um, have called for, um, one, um, police de decertification um, for, for law enforcement um, when law enforcement officers are involved in these situations and they are found 
um, they are found guilty. Um, what often happens is instead of um, being held accountable, a law enforcement officer will quit and then go work in another department in another community nearby, right? Um, and you have in the case of Devante Mitchell, and let's just be clear, Sam was killed on yep. Tuesday. Um, Devante um, was killed, oh, it was um, um, June 30th. Mm -hmm. That was a few weeks ago. And he was held down, not by police, but well, by security. security guards. And I have to say, yesterday when we went to the Hyatt, and I went to the different police to say, can you tell me where exactly Devante Mitchell was killed? They would say, uh, I, I don't know. You know, I am from Chicago, or I am from, and they named all these different places, Ohio. I am from, because there were all different law enforcement. And, of course, the local police, they also wouldn't tell me. Yep. But these weren't even police. They were security guards that he was held down. Yep. Explain and then talk about what you're demanding, what police have responded in both cases. Yeah. So um, in the case of Devante, um, what had happened was there was an, you know, the staff claimed that there was he was um, being disruptive in the in the Hyatt. In the Hyatt. Um, it eventually led to um, them assaulting him in the space. Um, apparently, he ended up in a bathroom at some a women's bathroom at some point and then was chased outside in which he was pinned down on the ground um, by at least two confirmed security guards. The other two folks, um, it wasn't confirmed if they were security or they were Hyatt staff. Um, what we do know is that the Hyatt has fired um, the, that security, the, that security staff team, as well as a few other staffers who worked um, in the space for not being compliant with their own policies. What that tells us, um, and, you know, the lawyer of Devante's family um, said it best, is that there is skepticism, um, at least from the Hyatt's perspective, in, their, in that, that, whole altercate, that whole altercation. When Milwaukee law enforcement arrived, they tried to, they found him unresponsive and tried to resuscitate him, and he sadly lost his life. Um, one of his, what we know was his last words was, I'm sorry. And often when, in these situations where folks are losing their lives, they are pleading with someone who, has, do, who have, has dominance for their life, and they don't respond and do anything. That hurts. And the videotape in both cases is devastating. We only have 30 seconds. But, Angelique, we're talking, uh, this is our last segment here in Milwaukee. Outside the Republican convention, has the Trump team gotten in touch with you? Have your local police gotten in touch with you? They absolutely have not. Um, and... I don't understand. You know, when we have evidence that Sam called home, uh, the, the sh shelterless community down there, by all accounts of his character and the character of the other person, um, it, it's absolutely not making sense. What do you want right now as you speak to a global audience? We have about 10 seconds. Yes, I want um, transparency. We want, um, we want not the... F clips of the video we want full we want full clips we want the autopsy um report um you know and we we really want justice for my brother um well we're not gonna stop here even as we go back to new york i want to thank you both for being with us uh, angelique sharp again condolences sister of sam sharp jr an unhoused black man killed by Columbus, Ohio police, not far from the Republican convention on Tuesday. And Wisconsin State Representative Darren Madison, his district includes Milwaukee, uh, where Devante Mitchell was killed. We thank you so much for being with us. We'll continue to follow this case. Breaking news, the International Court of Justice has ruled Israel's settlement policy in the occupied territories violates international law. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Longtime radio host Larry Bensky will be officially inducted into the California Historical Radio Society's Radio Hall of Fame during the Radio Day by the Bay this year, a celebration of everything radio from the California Historical Radio Society. KPFA staff will be there hosting a booth. This happens Saturday, July 20th from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. and is located at 2152 Central Avenue in Alameda. For more information, go online to the California Historical Radio Society at chrsradio.org.
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.